Happy New Year, everyone. This is Mike from vSwitch Zero. So yet again, I have a bunch of parts on the table, and it's time for another build-off video. So this time, it's the Socket A build-off. So that's right, Socket A, also known as Socket 462. And this was the platform that really put AMD on the map as a fierce competitor to Intel on the performance front. So I was originally thinking of uh, giving this build-off a pass, although I have many fond memories of Socket A, and I had a couple of really high-end systems back in the day. It's just a bit too new for me. I'm usually more interested in the gear from the you know early to mid 90s time frame. Even slot one is uh, sort of pushing it a bit for me. But hey, I really enjoy these build offs, and I'd figured I'd take a look at some of the older Socket A Thunderbird gear instead of the you know more popular Athlon XP systems that came out later on. I never actually owned anything from AMD in this generation. My first Socket A system was actually a Palmino 1800 plus. And uh, later on, I got pretty seriously into overclocking, and I had a uh, 3200 plus Barton, and uh, I really loved that Barton system. Had a 9800 Pro, and it was my first pretty serious uh, high end gaming system. And I even did some custom water cooling for it back in the day, so a lot of good memories there. But again, um, a lot newer than sort of what interests me these days. Uh, but anyway, I'm still really looking forward to uh, putting this system back together. Uh, some of the parts here are things that I have used in the past, so it's kind of fun revisiting them and also trying out something a bit new. So this is the motherboard I'm going to be using here. It was actually not originally the board I wanted to use. The um, the board I got for this build-off actually turned out to be bad, and I'll, I'll show you guys uh, what that board was and what it looks like in a bit. But this is the Asus A7V133. So this board was released in, I believe, early 2001, I think February or something like that. And it's based on the very popular, well at the time, via KT-133A chipset. The, uh, the KT-133 came out before it, and really the only difference between this uh, uh, A version and the previous is the uh, support for a 133 MHz FSB. When I say 133, it's actually a data double rate FSB, so it would be 266 MHz. So this could support uh, some of the newer Thunderbird chips with, uh, with that FSB. One of the first things you'll see that looks really interesting is this uh, VRM daughter board that's here. So all of the VRM components are actually sitting vertically on this little board, um, except for this couple of capacitors that are here, but um, I'm not sure if those are directly related to CPU power or not, but anyway, most of it is on that board, and that sort of clears up the socket area. I believe that was the intention, because uh, there were some issues when people started using much larger coolers on boards around this time, so having it on that, that board seemed to clear up the socket area a little bit. Now, there are some cons as well. Um, as you can imagine, trying to recap something like this is a bit of a pain because you're going to be doing it with not a lot of space back here. Uh, obviously they weren't thinking about recapping when these things were were built originally. You can see there's a whole bunch of little little angled pins down here that sort of connect it to the board and uh, you would think that's actually a connector but this is soldered on you can't remove it at all so uh, if you did want to remove this for recapping, that would be a pain. But anyway, these are sort of retro PC problems, not problems that were from when the thing was first released, so that's okay. Also, you'll see that uh, we've got active uh, Northbridge cooling here, so it's got a small little, I guess that's 40 or 50 mils, I'm not sure exactly how big it is. Thankfully, it does work great. It was very dusty when I got it, but um, I just cleaned it up, and it actually sounds quite good. It didn't even need oiling or anything like that. Um, you can see here that there's actually a cutout uh, on the, the, the uh, frame of the fan so that all of the airflow sort of gets directed away from the, the CPU area. So I guess that was a interesting design decision just to keep the CPU a bit cooler. So the interesting thing about the KT133A is that it does still use SD RAM. That's not DDR. Um, the AMD 760 chipset um, that came out before this actually did support DDR RAM, but you got to remember at the time DDR was very, very expensive. Um, and unlike the Pentium 4, the Athlons were not really starved for memory bandwidth. So um, using much faster DDR RAM really only got you about a 10% performance boost in sort of the best case scenario. So um, this KT 133A. Uh, came out later, but still only had SD RAM support, and it 
the goal of this was really to provide high performance uh, SD RAM based platform so that people could use the RAM they already had. A lot of people were bringing it from their previous platforms. Um, and also really, you know, it was so cheap and plentiful at the time, it, it only made sense to try to, to try to accommodate that. So there were some boards as well, and I'll show you the other board I have where there was sort of a transition period where um, you could actually run both on the, uh, the same board if you wanted to upgrade later on when the prices came down and that sort of thing. So very interesting time indeed. Um, another cool feature that this board has is this, not sure if you can really see it too well there, but there's a Promise um, ATA100 chip on here. So you can see there's twice the number of IDE channels you would expect to normally see. So the two at the bottom here are, are controlled by the, the Promise chip. And it does actually provide um, IDE RAID as well, which is pretty cool. That's not something you saw too often. This is really the time when RAID on consumer motherboards was starting to, to show up in the, in the uh, consumer space. Before that, you'd really only see it on servers and <clears throat> high-end workstations and stuff like that. So pretty cool. So yeah, that's uh, about it for the board. I'm just trying to think if there's anything else noteworthy here. Oh yeah, of course, how could I forget the AGP Pro slot? So AGP Pro was something that uh, Asus was really pushing for a while. And basically, it's, you can see here there's this little plastic uh, insert here. So this first part of the slot is uh, part of AGP Pro, as is the last part here. So that's why the slot looks a lot longer than a typical AGP slot. And um, it doesn't really bring anything performance-wise or, you know, bandwidth or anything like that to the table. It's, it's simply a power delivery enhancement. So early on, um, I, I believe this, the standard AGP slot can deliver 40-something watts, but, you know, cards were getting more and more power hungry. And uh, I guess originally they didn't really want to deal with external headers and, you know, Molex connectors and stuff like that. So AGP Pro was the answer to that. It could deliver, I believe it's up to 110 watts or something via the slot. And I think there's just more pins available for power delivery there. The, um, I believe there's two standards. I think there's AGP Pro 50 and 110, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, I don't know if this one will do the, the 110, but it will do the, the 50 watt power delivery from the, the slot directly. So that's pretty cool. Um, I do have a bit of a treat uh, as well for this video. I found an AGP Pro card for next to nothing on eBay. So I always wanted to try one out. So we'll get to see that today as well. So for the CPU, I originally planned to use something a bit faster. Um, but the 1.33 gigahertz Thunderbird I had turned out to be bad, but that's okay. Um, I've got one of the original Thunderbird chips here released uh, from back in June of 2000. So this is definitely a bit more true to the early socket A system I'm going for here. So this is the, I'm not sure if you can see the actual text on there, but this is the AMD Athlon 700. So it's a 700 megahertz, 256K cache part. Um, so this one has a TDP of only, I think it's 40 watts and um, the cache is running at the full processor speed, which is great. If you recall, AMD also had the slot A platform. Um, so you can see here, this is the slot A 700 megahertz uh, CPU that I have here as well. This was very similar to the slot one systems that Intel had where the cache was on a, on a special bus that ran at a fraction of the CPU performance. So, or a fraction of the CPU frequency, I should say. Um, so uh, socket A was really AMD's move away from that. And this is very similar to what Intel did with the um, copper mine P3s and also the Mendocino Celerons that came before them. So um, really, really good performance. Clock for clock, it was much faster than the uh, the Pentium 4 uh, at the time. And yeah, this is the uh, 100 megahertz front side bus, so data doubled to uh, 200 megahertz. It's not the, the faster ones that came out a bit later. But uh, yeah, I really like these Thunderbird chips. They're actually, they look a lot more substantial and higher quality than the, the Barton and Palmino and uh, T-Bread ones that came out after. Um, this is actually a real ceramic top not sure if you can hear that but you'll notice they do have these little foam pads because they are exposed die CPUs there's no heat spreader which is actually kind of strange because I know that um, the K6 K62 they all had a pretty nice uh, heat spreader implementation I think it may be due to the uh, thermal 
uh, I don't want to say issues, but you know, the increasing thermal load that these chips kept having as they got faster and faster, I guess uh, it was more of a, a cooling consideration than anything because AMD was obviously uh, no stranger to a heat spreader. So these little foam pads here help to uh, ensure that the heat sink doesn't crush a, a corner or a side of the, the die, which unfortunately was a, a, a fairly common thing that did happen back in the day. You heard horror stories of people chipping the dies and then they stopped working and that sort of thing. So you do have to install the cooler with uh, with caution with these. So, But anyway, I think that's a good, uh, a good chip that should be a good fit for a 2000, 2001 base system like this. So so for RAM, I'm not doing anything too special. These are just uh, two sticks that came with the uh, the board that you see here. I'm assuming this is PC-133. I'm honestly not sure. I'll have to look up the uh, the model number there. I've never actually heard of uh, Avant or seen these types of sticks before, so it will be interesting to try. Um, it definitely works at PC-100 speeds, but um, if not, I do have some crucial PC-133 I can use as well. Uh, I believe this is a total of 512 megs, so each stick is 256, so we'll go with that. So for CPU cooling, I just have this StarTech uh, heatsink. This was actually the one that was included with this board when I bought it on eBay. Um, the fan I did replace, this is just a Fractal Design 60 mil fan. I believe it's 25 mils thick, so it's uh, pretty substantial and, and works well. Should be fine for a 40 watt TDP uh, CPU. And actually, this one's probably big enough for some of the, the later models as well, so we'll go with that. So for the video card, I'm going to go with the venerable NVIDIA GeForce 3 Ti 200. So there was a few cards I was considering for this build, but uh, with the release date of October of 2001, the GeForce 3 was really good fit for the age of the system I was uh, targeting here. So this card is actually pretty nostalgic to me. I owned a similar model back in the day, and I really loved it. Um, this one's made by MSI. It has a really nice uh, red PCB and uh, silver heatsink. There are heat sinks on the the memory on the top and side banks and uh, a separate one in the center for the actual core itself. Um, the card I had I think was a chain tech model back in the day. It was also a TI-200. It had a gold heat sink with a similar shape uh, there. This uh, TI-200 was actually not the first GeForce 3 released. There was a uh, card called just the GeForce 3 which was the first one. It had no TI suffix. Uh, it's actually a little bit faster than this one. Um, this one's considered more of a mid-range card, even though it's the lowest in the GeForce 3 series. All of the GeForce 3s are pretty good performers. And uh, the TI-500 is the top-end card at the time. So really the only difference between the models is the uh, core and memory clocks. The TI-200 and 500 uh, also come in a 128 meg version. The uh, original GeForce 3 was uh, 64 meg only, but from what I remember, there was actually no difference at all in the performance in most cases. Uh, not very many games could take advantage of 128 megs anyway. So you've probably noticed the uh, awkwardly mounted 40 mil Noctua fan that's sitting on there. Uh, so as you can imagine, the tiny fan that was included uh, died a, a horrible death. It sounds absolutely terrible, as you can uh, see here. I um, just used two uh, long screws to sort of attach it to the heatsink itself, and uh, this thing actually cools probably a little bit better than the included fan when it was actually working properly anyway. So, Anyhow, I think the uh, GeForce 3 is a terrific card. It performs really, really well. I loved mine back in the day. It could handle just about anything I threw at it, so I think it's a perfect uh, choice for the system. So next up, as I promised, here is an AGP Pro video card. So this thing is an absolute monstrosity. As you can see, it's probably twice the length of any consumer grade card that was around at the time. This is the 3D Labs Wildcat 3 6110. So it's a uh, professional workstation card. It's really not intended for gaming at all, but um, as you'll see soon, I did uh, give it a try with some games, so you'll see how it does with some OpenGL titles. Um, this thing can barely fit in the video frame, it's so long, but you can see that the power delivery on this thing is very substantial. There are a ton of capacitors and uh, all sorts of VRM components on here. So this was obviously a good candidate for an AGP Pro card because I don't think 40 watts out of the slot is going to be enough to uh, 
to provide for this out of a normal AGP slot, I mean. So you can see the, the connector here looks quite different. So this piece at the end here is uh, part of the AGP Pro standard, as is this little notched piece at the front here. And this is the piece where you have to remove the plastic from the, uh, the actual slot. The reason they put that protective plastic piece in there is because some cards don't have that sort of like little tab at the end that you see sometimes. So it can move around in the slot a bit and you don't want that otherwise it could short out. So that's uh, just some extra protection they put there. The, uh, the last piece here does actually have a um, there's a little divider in the slot to protect against that piece moving around. But but yeah, this thing is is incredible. Um, it's got dual DVI. I believe this is, is that TV out? No, this is actually a 3D glasses connector. So I'm not sure what a professional workstation card needs, needs with that. But yeah, really impressive. And it's got, uh, I believe, 192 megs of memory total. It's split into two different types for different purposes. But uh, yeah, multiple multiple uh, processing chips on the card as well. I really, I won't even pretend that I know what any of this does on the card. Um, two fans there, so clearly this this was sort of intended for a front to back work, uh, front to back airflow type scenario. Um, I believe this one, you can see there's a compact uh, part number there, so this was included with um, some compact workstation of some sort, but um, I don't think these were actually sold separately. You had to buy them from a company like Compaq in a workstation. They were not really like just your average add-on card that you could pick up from from anywhere. So as far as price, from what I've seen, like the, and again, because it wasn't sold uh, individually, it was kind of hard to get a price, but the, um, the additional price to add one of these into a workstation at the time was about $1,500 US. So very, very expensive card. Um, I'm more interested just to try out the AGP Pro slot, just to never seen it in use, so it'll be a first for me, and I'm curious to see what happens. So I've got a couple of uh, PCI sound cards in my parts bin, but I thought I'd go with the uh, Sound Blaster Live PCI. So I had this uh, exact card, or one very similar to it anyway, in my uh, Athlon XP Palmino system back in the day. Uh, it was actually a very, very popular sound card, um, probably around the the late 90s early 2000s it was sold for for several years and um, I can't say I'm overly attached to it it's not like it has sentimental value but I figured of the cards I had this is probably one of the better ones and uh, may as well give it a try in this system uh, when this thing was first released back in 1998 it got a lot of mixed reactions um, I think most of those most of that negative feedback was probably due to uh, compatibility problems. You know, there was the transition from ISA to PCI sound cards at the time. It caused a lot of problems with uh, older DOS games and things like that. So in actual fact, this was quite a big step up and improvement from earlier Sound Blaster cards. I know it's uh, known to have much better uh, sound quality. It's got a lower noise floor. I think a lot of the audio processing done internally on the card is all digital too, so there's uh, much better audio quality. Um, and although MIDI was kind of being phased out at the time, there still are AWE type features that this card offers. Um, but because it's on the PCI bus and has a lot more bandwidth available, it can store samples in, in main memory instead of uh, having to rely on onboard uh, sound. So yeah, a lot of uh, a lot of positives that this card had. It also had the whole EAX uh, environmental audio thing that was uh, uh, quite a heavily marketed thing back in the, in the day. Uh, I was never a big fan. I didn't really like the way it sounded all that much, so I never really cared too much about it, but it does uh, support that as well. So for storage, I had a few things I was considering. Obviously, you've got the uh, retro PC enthusiast favorite, either a compact flash or SD adapter with a uh, high performance card of some kind and, um, you know, get nice, reliable, high performance, low latency storage. But uh, who wants to do that? That's no fun. So we're going to go with the uh, old faithful IDE hard drive. So this is a Western Digital WD400. Uh, I'm not sure if this is 5400 RPM or 7200, but uh, it's a pretty run-of-the-mill drive that you'd see around that time. I'm just trying to find the date on here. Oh, December 2003. So it's uh, maybe a little bit newer than what uh, was around at the time, but uh, we'll go with that. That way we get some nice nostalgic crunching noises and uh, where's the fun in letting things load instantly? Back in the day, you had to uh, wait and contemplate life a little bit when you clicked on things, so we'll, uh, we'll go with that.
So this is the case I'm going to use for the build. This is just an Antec VSK. I think it's a 4000 um, ATX tower. Takes full-size ATX boards. I've got an OptiArc uh, DVD-ROM drive here. I think this originally came out of a, a Dell system of some kind, but it's uh, a little bit of a grayish color, but it matches pretty good. I've got a real 1.44 floppy and the GoTech uh, drive in here as well. These do bo both work simultaneously, so there's an A and a B drive that you can use. I did put some cool stickers on here a while back. Uh, I used to call this the 486 of Doom because uh, I used to have an AT case in here and use this for the um, 486 Quake race that we did a while back. So uh, I'll just show you the back really quick. I, I'm not a big fan of this case. It's pretty cheaply made. Like it's, you know, beer can thickness here, but it is a traditional layout with the power supply on the top, which is which is nice for older systems. Um, I don't have the original IO shield that came with this board, but uh, this is just a generic one and the layout's pretty standard so it works. There is cutouts for the audio, onboard audio that is not there, but that's okay. So I got the system together pretty quickly. It wasn't, uh, wasn't too difficult. Thankfully this case is somewhat modern, so there's a lot of space that uh, can be used for, for the video card and stuff. There's actually a hollowed out area back here, so the, the very long 3D Labs Wildcat fit in there surprisingly well. I'm not sure if you can see there, but it does block the um, uh, Promise uh, IDE ports, so you can't actually use those when it's installed, but that's okay. I'm just using the uh, the VIA onboard uh, IDE controller right now, which is fine. But yeah, I'm pretty happy with that. Um, oh yeah, and the power supply in the system is an SPI uh, Sparkle jobber. It's 300 watts. I really like this power supply actually because it's uh, uh, got a really hefty 5 volt rail, which was important with uh, older systems. And here's the system with the uh, GeForce 3 put in, so it fits in really well. I did uh, steal a fan header over here for the Noctua fan that's on it. All right, so let's check out some games. First up is Diablo 2, released in June of 2000. This is actually the uh, Lord of Destruction expansion that was released a year later. I was a big fan of the original, and I sunk a ton of time into this game when it first came out, both single player and on Battle.net. within this cave. And next up is Quake 3 Arena, released just a few weeks before the turn of the millennium. So Quake 3 is really fast paced and the GeForce 3 just eats it for breakfast here.
So next is SimCity 4, released in early 2003. I got this game when it first came out and I played it quite a bit. It was a lot of fun. It can also be really demanding on your system as your city gets really large. I had this uh, originally on my Palmino 1800 Plus system and even that one uh, had some trouble keeping up eventually. So in this smaller city here it uh, runs just fine. So next up is Return to Castle Wolfenstein. I played this game quite a bit too back in the day. I think it's Quake 3 engine based and it runs really well on the GeForce 3 at 1024 by 768. Your orders, Herr Doctor. Go and get the other one. This one is almost finished. Jawohl. So this is 3D Mark 2001, one of my favorite benchmarks from back in the day. So at uh, lower detail settings, the GeForce 3 has no problem and it pushes around 60 to 70 frames per second most of the time. With higher detail, it does drop below 20, but uh, for the time, I think that was, uh, was quite good. This nature scene in 3D Mark 2001 was always my favorite. I still remember the first time I saw it, I was just blown away by the detail and the effects. I thought it was just the coolest thing, especially that it could even run somewhat smoothly on the hardware available at the time. So the final score was a little over 4,000, so actually pretty low. I expected better, but then again, the CPU is probably holding me back a lot, and there's still a lot of optimization that could be done here too, I think. Alright, and finally, let's run some tests on the 3D Labs Wildcat 3. Uh, I'm going to run some games and uh, some benchmarks here, but uh, just take a quick look at the driver. I didn't have any trouble finding one online. You can see here that this is the uh, custom configuration pages that get added into the uh, display properties page. There's some hardware information here that you can see about the card. You can see uh, 192 megs total RAM, 64 megs and 64 megs times 2 for texture. And there's also a list of uh, supported features down here as well. This configuration wizard's kind of neat. It looks like it can do all kinds of driver optimizations based on whatever application you want to use. So all of the 3D modeling stuff that you'd expect in CAD are listed here. So all kinds of workstation related stuff. Um, there are also some default settings for things like uh, Direct3D. So I'm just going to select that here. I'm not sure what would actually give the best performance from a gaming perspective. But anyway, let's uh, let's start with GLQuake and see how it does. I was actually surprised at how smooth it ran, but then again, this card was really designed with OpenGL in mind. Not for gaming, but for modeling, but nonetheless, it has a really, really good and accurate OpenGL implementation. 
From a performance perspective, let's run a time demo and see how it does. Well, I couldn't figure out how to disable V-Sync, so it did the maximum 60 frames per second here, which is fantastic. Not bad for a workstation card. And even in Quake 3 Arena, it's surprisingly smooth, not bad at all. Um, this is a bit of a newer game than GL Quake, obviously, but uh, again, because it's OpenGL, it seems to handle it just fine. I did get some occasional graphical glitches and some weird things happening with lighting, but um, for the most part, it looks great and, and plays great, too. I got about uh, almost 40 frames per second, 37.5 in the time demo. I really wish I could say that Direct3D played well also, but it really doesn't. The performance is just terrible, uh, even if it looks okay in this one. But some of the games just had terrible graphical glitches and just didn't look right at all. So uh, I think there's a lot of features uh, of Direct3D that this card just doesn't support, so that could be part of the problem there. The score is uh, almost laughable here, but that's uh, probably because so many of the tests couldn't even run at all. Thanks for watching. So there's many others putting together Socket A build off videos, so be sure to check them out. You can just put the hashtag in the YouTube search bar to find them. Eventually they'll all be shared out in the playlist. Thanks again. Be sure to like and subscribe if you'd like to see more retro content like this.